Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. Yeah, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, May 11th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. Well, look, it's been a very, very busy day, and I'm preparing to teach my online course on Saturday, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School. So you'll hear more about that. Uh, you know, on yesterday's show, we talked about the Stoner Rebellion of 1739 uh, that started uh, September 9th, 1739, and it led to the uh, Negro Act of 1740 in South Carolina. The Negro Act was signed into law on May 10th, uh, 1740 in South Carolina, and, and that's going to lead to the um, uh, the Sundry Moore Act, the Sundry Moore Act of uh, 1790 in South Carolina, dealing with the uh, Sundry Moors. Well, May 28th, May 28th is the anniversary of the signing of the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which pushed the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians off their land in southeastern uh, United States, uh, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, and Florida, that area. It was approximately 100,000 of them forced off their land, and they go over 1,000 miles out west into Oklahoma on what is known as the Trail of Tears. Now, many people have heard of that story of the Trail of Tears, but a lot of people did not know that um, there were Africans on the Trail of Tears as well, because uh, the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians all owned African slaves as well, okay? So there was a big article from CNN.com from, um, what was it, Sunday, May 9th, Sunday, May 9th, 2021. Native Americans weren't alone on the Trail of Tears enslaved Africans were too. Native Americans weren't alone on the Trail of Tears. Enslaved Africans were too. So we'll, we're gonna talk some about this history today. And then this ties into the history of uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We know that January, we know that June 1st is the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people say that uh, it was uh, North Tulsa, the Greenwood district where African Americans live because of segregation. Uh, many people say, okay, that was an all black town. Well, it was predominantly African American because you had uh, Creek Indians who uh, lived in uh, North Tulsa also. You had Creek Indians and nor, and, to, and we know that Tulsa, Oklahoma was founded by Creek Indians around 1836 uh, when they get pushed off their land in southeastern United States because of, because of the Indian Removal Act of uh, 1830, okay, because of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. So all of this history is tied together, okay? All this history is tied together. And uh, a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. But also, um, you know, as Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small, two of my teachers, as they teach us, that African history and culture gives us our foundation. It gives us our values, our interests, and our principles, our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. And this influences our, uh, this gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. And it's our values, our interests, and our principles that give us our self-esteem, our self-development, and our self-worth, okay? So all of this is uh, connected. So we're gonna talk about that on today's show. We'll deal with uh, Native Americans who were not alone on the Trail of Tears. Enslaved Africans were on the Trail of Tears also. Uh, and then there's an update in the Andrew Brown uh, case as well out of Elizabeth City. The family 
of uh, Andrew Brown, as well as uh, attorneys for the family, were able to view more footage uh, today of the killing of Andrew Brown. And it further confirms uh, what they say that Andrew Brown was e executed. It further confirms uh, them saying that Andrew Brown was unjustly killed, that he was executed. So we, we have an update there. And then also there was a story from, um, I saw a story from newsone.com dealing with um, Tim Tebow and Colin Kaepernick. And it appears that Tim Tebow is going to be back in the NFL after almost 10 years out of the league. I think it's been eight years. OK, out of the league. But Colin Kaepernick is not back in the league. OK, so you have a lot of people saying this is white privilege. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that also. All right. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you. And get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the comforts of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history, politics education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, love, sex, health, relationships, love, sex, health, issue, health issues, uh, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, if you want to support the African History Network, you can do so through uh, Cash App or PayPal. We definitely need your support. We're here six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, keep broadcasting, stay on the air, pay some of the bills. Um, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, you can also register for the online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the Transatlantic Slave Trade taking place. Uh, so we do a class live. All the sessions are recorded and they are archived. You can go back and watch them over and over again. As soon as you register, you can watch the class we just did this past Saturday. Uh, the class is regularly $130 on sale, $80. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have video clips, book references, articles. You're going to learn a lot. We just posted the link here. So you can register for that. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. All right, we're coming up here on the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. How's everybody doing? Okay, everybody share this broadcast on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by. All right, back from break in three minutes. Back from break in three minutes. Okay, we've got Ruby. Hey, Ruby, did you email me? I sent, I gave you my email address yesterday, uh, last night. Did you email me, Ruby? Stand by. Okay, we got Eric, Larry. Um,
got TC, Tracy, John Ray, Shaniqua, LaShawn. Stand by. Stand by, everybody. Back from breaking two minutes. So I heard from uh, a few people, they really liked the show yesterday when we dealt with the Stono Rebellion. I'll, I'll be re-airing that uh, after this show. Back from breaking one minute. The Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 9 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Tuesday, May 11th, 2021, and we are live. All right, so right before the break, uh, we were talking about some of the topics we're going to discuss today. And I talked about the um, Trail of Tears. This really ties into history. You know, um, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow the people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you've been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. And uh, history tells you how, what the history tells you what happened and how you got to this point where you are today. And it gives you some idea of what you need to do to get to where you want to go. But you have to understand the history, the laws and policies that were put in place that got you to the point where you are today. Okay, so if we look at this uh, dealing with the Trail of Tears, okay, and this ties into the Indian Removal Act of uh, 1830, as well as uh, the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians. Okay. Uh, I want to look at, there was an article here from uh, CNN.com, and I'm going to pull this back up. Okay, there, there's an article from CNN.com, Native Americans weren't alone on the Trail of Tears. Native Americans weren't alone on the Trail of Tears. Enslaved Africans were too. Now, this article is from May 9th, 2021. We're going to pull it up here on the screen share. And May 30th, uh, now you're going to see um, some commemorations of the signing of the Trail of Tears. I was reading about that today among uh, the Choctaw Native Americans. Uh, because May 28th is, uh, is the anniversary of the signing of the Indian Removal Act, which was signed May 28th, 1830, okay? So this, this article is from Nicole uh, Chavez uh, for CNN.com. Now, and actually in the uh, article, they show the intersection of Greenwood Avenue and Archer uh, in 1917. So this is... Um, a few years before the attack in 1921, it says many of the in this image were later destroyed in the 1921 massacre. So they're, they're showing this in Oklahoma. Okay, this was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we know Tulsa was founded by Creek Indians around um, 1836. Okay, who got pushed off that land because of the Indian Removal Act. Tulsa, Oklahoma was founded by Creek Indians around 1836. And the word Tulsa, the word Tulsa comes from the Creek Indian word Talasi. The word Tulsa comes from the Creek Indian word uh, Talasi. Okay, so uh, you, you can't get away from this history. When you study the, the language, when you study the, the history, this ties in the African people, this ties in the Native Americans. All right. 
let me uh, flip over here. I'm trying to pull up this article. Just one second here. Okay. So it talks about uh, an author named Elena E. Roberts. Elena, Elena Roberts is African-American. And it says, hold on a second, let me flip back over to it. So it says, uh, when Elena Roberts started piecing her family's history together, she made a surprising discovery that changed what it meant to be a black American or what it meant to be African American. Her father's ancestors uh, in Oklahoma were once, in, were once enslaved by Native Americans. Now more people are finding about this history today and we know it was uh, heavily among the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee and Seminole Indians. Now nearly a century before Tulsa's Greenwood District became a beacon of black prosperity uh, in the 1920s, Native American tribes uh, or Native American nations and thousands of enslaved uh, African people arrived in the state of Oklahoma. Now, um, uh, member, now Oklahoma becomes a state in the Union in 1907. Before that, it's a territory in the Union. Okay, and this also ties into the history of the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, because the U.S. is going to get uh, about 828,000 square miles of land in the Louisiana Purchase from France. Uh, the French, Napoleon Bonaparte, they get the behinds kicked by the Haitians. Uh, during the Haitian Revolution, and the, the, the France is trying to raise money, so they sell the land here that they stole from Native Americans, and they sell that to another thief called the United States of America. So the U.S. is going to carve out about 15 states, 15 territories, 15 states, out of the land that they get from Louisiana, uh, from the Louisiana Purchase, and the the, the the land that they get from the Louisiana Purchase is going to double the size of the United States and it's going to increase the need now for more enslaved Africans to work the land in the territories where they're going to have slavery. They try to keep a balance between free states and slave states, but uh, it's going to increase the need in some of these territories for enslaved Africans. This is, the, this is the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, which came about because of the Haitian Revolution. And Oklahoma is going to be one of those territories that the U.S. gets in the Louisiana Purchase. Okay. So this is, this is why you have to understand the chronology of history. All, all this history is connected. Okay. Uh, and I hated history when I was in school, by the way, because they taught white history largely. I hated history <laughs> when I was in school. It wasn't until I got to college that I really started really um, having an interest in history outside of the classroom. Now, members of the uh, five tribes, or what are also known as the five civilized tribes of Native Americans, because they took on the ways of white people. We'll talk about that in just a minute. The uh, the Chickasaw, Cherokee, uh, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole Native American nations, uh, members of these five tribes have been forced out of their homelands in the deep south, okay? Uh, Georgia and uh, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, and Florida, leading to the exodus known as the Trail of Tears. Now, uh, Elena E. Roberts says owning slaves or only African slaves was a part of their strategy to assimilate into American society and it allowed them to be seen as different from other Native American people and as more civilized. Okay, now Elena Roberts is an associate professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh. Now Elena Roberts, and here's a picture of her, maybe I'll interview her on the show. Uh, Elena Roberts tells the story of how Oklahoma became a melting pot and the decades of racial tensions that preceded the Tulsa race massacre in her new book entitled, 
I've been here all the while, black freedom on native land. I'll, I've been here all the while, black freedom on native land. Now, speaking of being here all the while, um, those that are enrolled in my online course, we talk about this. You've also heard the interviews I've done with Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans with Africans Documented Evidence, okay? Um, African, uh, African people are the original Native Americans. Now, what I mean by this is I'm not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. That happens thousands of years later. I'm saying the uh, when you read his book and you look at the evidence, the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA on the planet and go all around the world, uh, the Khoisan, who were the ancestors that I knew in the Twa, the Khoisan were here in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago in the territory today known as South Carolina. And this is before the people who we call Native Americans come into existence. And, you know, we're making voyages from Africa to uh, from here back and forth. Um, so this was our land stolen from us a number of times. So we, so we have to understand this. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened. You want to understand a chronology of thousands of years of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade starting in 1441 with the Portuguese going into uh, Mauritania. But just because African people had been here for tens of thousands of years, that does not mean that uh, hundreds of thousands were still not brought to this land. Uh, you can go back to 1526 with the Spanish taking Africans into the territory called South Carolina. This is before uh, the British colonies were set up starting in 1607 in Virginia. Okay, so we have to understand this chronology uh, of history. All right, how's everybody doing? 313-778-7600 uh, is the call in number if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600. Here's the call in them if you have a quick question or comment. Um, and then also, if you want to support the African History Network, uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. All right, let's continue here. So, um, Elena E. Roberts, associate professor. Uh, of history at the University of Pittsburgh uh, is the author of the book, I've Been Here All the While, Black Freedom on Native Land. And she tells the story of how Oklahoma became a melting pot in the decades of racial tensions that preceded the Tulsa Race Massacre that uh, began January 1st, 1921. And you have the events May 30th and May 31st of 1921 that precipitated the race massacre. Now, for Elena E. Roberts, the 1921 Tulsa race massacre is only a portion of the complicated history of African American, Native American, and white people, or European Americans, in uh, Oklahoma. After the Civil War, Civil War is 1861-1865, the five, uh, these five Native American nations signed a treaty with the United States government abolishing slavery. Because they, they, many of these Native American nations wanted to hold on to their slaves after, hold on to their African slaves after the Civil War ended, okay? And they said, basically, they didn't have to give up their slaves because they were sovereign nations, all right? So, yeah, yeah, the Civil War ended, but we still want to keep our slaves. Now, the other thing that's important, um, the other thing that's important to understand is that all five uh Civilized uh, all five nations of um, what are known as the five civilized tribes of Native Americans. Uh, all five of them fought on behalf of the South during the Civil War, okay, because they wanted to maintain slavery. Okay, so all five of them um, fought on behalf of the South during the Civil War as well. Now, they're going to sign uh, the uh, Indian treaties of 1866 with the U.S. government. And they're going to get, you know, uh, territory. Uh, and what, what actually what happens is they're going to be put on Indian reservations. OK, they're going to be put on Indian reservations. The reason why is, is because prior to uh, the Civil War, 
they were on um, Indian territories. They had Indian territories. And what's going to happen is, is because they, uh, when they signed these treaties for these Indian territories prior to the Civil War, there were clauses in those treaties that stated that they could never uh, take up arms against the Union. Well, these treaties most likely were in English, and a lot of them didn't speak English. So when they fought on behalf of the South in the Civil War, and we know the South seceded from the Union, starting with South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, um, they committed treason against the Union. This violated their treaty. So, they're, so they're, the Indian territories are going to be taken back. They're going to be put on Indian reservations. All right? So all, all this history is connected. Now, after the Civil War, the five tribes uh, signed a treaty with the U.S. government abolishing slavery. Those formerly enslaved by the tribes known as freedmen, black freedmen, so you, you hear them referred to as freedmen or freed people. They built churches and schools. Now, it's interesting that after slavery, they were called freedmen or freed people. Notice how many of us say we're descendants of slaves, not descendants of former slaves or descendants of freed people, descendants of black freedmen, descendants of black freed people. Because after, like, like when you look at the Freedmen's Bank, the Freedmen's Bank was, was a bank created by the federal government for formerly enslaved Africans. It wasn't called the former slave bank. It was called the Freedmen's Bank. You're going to see after slavery, they refer to as freedmen. So you have to ask the question, right? Why do we put our ancestors back into a state that they were freed from? Why do we put our ancestors back into a state of slavery that they were freed from? When you go study during Reconstruction, they're referred to as freedmen. So why don't we keep putting them back into a state that they were freed from? Maybe it's because we think like slaves. Just a thought. So study Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. So those formerly enslaved by the tribes known as freedmen or freed people built churches and schools. They also acquired land, built businesses, built communities. They later received allotments of land as part of the 1887 Dawes Allotment Act, which redistributed about 138 million uh, acres of land, the Dawes Allotment Act, uh, named after Senator Henry L. Dawes, 1887. Now, that was supposed to be a reallocation of land going to Native Americans and, and, and black Indians, things like this. Uh, but white people got two thirds of the land. There is a, uh, at um, Britannica.com, they have a entry for the Dawes Allotment Act, uh, Dawes General Allotment Act of 1887 at Britannica.com, Britannica so you can read that. We'll pull this up here uh, quickly. Uh, Dawes General Allotment Act, uh, 1887. Uh, February 8, 1887, U.S. law providing for the distribution of Indian reservation land among individual Native Americans with the aim of creating responsible farmers in the white man's image. It was sponsored in several sessions of Congress by Senator Henry L. Dawes of Massachusetts. It was finally uh, enacted in February 1887. OK, and. Um, Let's see, the original supporters of the act were genuinely interested in the welfare of Native Americans, but there were not enough votes in Congress to pass it until it was amended. Okay, scroll down. Uh, there's more. Okay, the fifth, yeah, 138, 138 million acres of land. Um, 
and white people ended up getting two thirds of this land also. This is where you get this is where you get the concept of a five dollar Indian from. And this was like a census, kind of like a census that had to be taken. And to get your name added to this Dawes roll to be allocated land, you had to anglicize your name. You had to anglicize your name, take on an English name, anglicize your name. So when white people found out about this, they started paying five dollars to have their names added to the roll so they can get this land. OK, kind of like how white people found out about the five billion dollars in in loan forgiveness and in aid in the one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan for African-American farmers and Native American farmers and Hispanic farmers and Asian American farmers. And then they started suing the government saying we're being discriminated against. But you didn't say anything when you got twenty six billion dollars in twenty twenty from the Trump administration and African-American farmers got twenty point eight million one tenth of one percent out of twenty six billion dollars. You were silent. Kind of like that. You know, we've talked about that here on the show. OK, uh, there was an interview with the Washington Post that U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, Secretary Tom Vilsack did. Uh, March 21st, March 25th, okay, March 25th, and uh, Tom Vilsack laid out this history, and you have people like um, Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, people like Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina running around calling this racism, but Senator Lindsey Graham ignores the previous 100 years of racism against African-American farmers that caused them to lose 92% of their land, almost uh, 12 million acres of land, okay? Kind of kind of like that. Of those who identify their race or ethnicity, black farmers received only 20.8 million of the nearly 26 billion in two rounds of payments under the coronavirus food assistance program announced by the Trump administration in April of 2020, okay? Now, not a single Republican voted for the American Rescue Plan. It was only voted on. It was only voted for by Democrats, and Joe Biden signed it into law. There are resources in there to help African American farmers. This is something that Senator Tim Scott, when he delivered his rebuttal, the GOP rebuttal to Joe Biden's uh, speech to a joint session of Congress, uh, Wednesday, April twenty eighth, two thousand twenty one. When this is one of the things that uh, Senator Tim Scott was talking about when he said uh, it's backwards to use discriminatory policies to address discrimination. This is one of the things he was talking about. Because many, many Republicans are saying this is racism. They ignore the previous years of history of racism. They ignore that and they call this racism. So let's continue. How's everybody doing? All right, I want to go back to the article from CNN. So uh, they later received land allotments as part of the 1887 Dawes Allotment Act, which dismantled indigenous reservations and redistributed the land. Some were granted tribal citizenship, but many were not. Now, Elena Roberts' great great grandmother was among the thousands of African American women and men once held in bondage by the Chickasaw Native American tribe, the Chickasaw Native American tribe, uh, who received land allotments. Her family has now lived in the state of Oklahoma for generations. Now, African Americans began building wealth and founded all black towns. And Oklahoma probably had, Oklahoma was probably the state with the most all black towns. If it wasn't, if it didn't have the most, it was one of the states with the most all black towns. By uh, late 19th century, Oklahoma attracted people of all races who saw it as an opportunity for a fresh start, land ownership and prosperity, but soon it became a hotbed for racial tensions. Now, oil is going to be discovered in the early 1900s in Oklahoma, and this is going to cause people of all races to come in, but especially African-Americans, because, um, you know, we saw it as a way we saw it as a land of opportunity where we could uh, uh, work and acquire land and, and, and be independent. Uh, now, Elena Roberts recently spoke with CNN about her book, The Quest for Land and Freedom in the Years Leading to the Tulsa Race Massacre 
and how learning about Oklahoma's past changed her views on race. Um, okay, so they have an excerpt of the interview here. You can check that out. Um, she, so she was asked, it can be hard to talk about this period of history because of how complex it is and because it involves several communities of color. What would you tell people who prefer to avoid this complicated conversation, like many Republicans? Uh, many Republicans don't want to talk about this history, don't want to talk about racism and slavery and things like this. Um, Elena E. Roberts said, it's certainly difficult. It's not the happy narrative that we sometimes want to think about. I think that if we want to come together today and form interracial coalitions, uh, like last year's Black Lives Matter protests and how people of different races have come together to fight against anti-Asian hatred in a powerful and honest way, we need to acknowledge the past and the issues that we've had there. Well, we need to acknowledge the past regardless, whether you have interracial coalitions or what have you. And even the abolitionist movement, you know, you had a lot of African-American abolitionists, you know, during slavery, but you have white abolitionists also working alongside um, African-American abolitionists as well. So even if you don't have interracial coalitions, we need to understand this history. America needs a massive history lesson. Americans are very ignorant of history. Uh, she was asked a question, in the case of the formerly enslaved uh, uh, African-Americans, they had a chance to leave Oklahoma after emancipation. And as you mentioned in the book, blend as African-Americans in the United States territories, but many stayed including your great grandmother, why? So Elena Roberts said, I argue that it's really the land and the communities that they built within these Indian nations that ends up being more important to them than political rights. So instead of going to the United States and joining this congressional action that is happening right after the Civil War with Republicans, they decided to stay in tribal nations where uh, they don't necessarily have all the rights. For my ancestors in Chickasaw Nation, they don't have rights as citizens at all, but being able to really stay together with their communities and being able to own land is more important to them. Because, the, see, even when you go back and, and look at special field order number 15, uh, known as 40 acres and a mule, uh, the, the goal there that came about, uh, Gen General William T. Sherman had a, uh, a meeting with African-American leaders, most of them uh, ministers, and, and, and in early 1865. And he asked them, he said, look, civil war is coming to an end. These four million enslaved, enslaved African people are going to be set free. What is it that your people need to be free? What is it that your people need to be independent? They unanimously said land. So the special field order number 15, also known as 40 acres in the mule, was an allocation of 400,000 acres of coastal land in South Carolina, uh, Florida, and Georgia. South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. It wasn't all the land, and it wasn't land in all the South. It was coastal land in South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. Land to be uh, broken up into or allocated into plots of up to 40 acres. It went to about 40,000 African American families, something like that. Until the land, most of that land was taken back by President Andrew Johnson, who, who uh, succeeded uh, Lincoln. Uh, and when you when you read this, in, in, in Dr. Henry Lewis Gates Jr. has an article uh, for theroot.com, an extensive article that deals with the history of 40 acres and a mule, because a lot of people misunderstand that. It wasn't reparations. People think it was reparations. That wasn't reparations. They weren't saying, because you all work for free, we're going to give you this land. No, they were saying, look, it's inevitable they're going to be set free. Now, what do y'all need to be? What do y'all need to be independent so y'all don't keep coming begging us for stuff? What do, you, what do you all need? We need land. Okay, we're going to give you land. It wasn't, we're going to give you land because you work for free. Okay? Just so people understand that. It's saying, look, it wasn't because of what you did in the past. It's saying, look, you're going to be set free. Now, what do you need in the future to be independent? 
And then also when you when you study it, it was also supposed to be uh, like an independent nation where we governed ourselves um, as well. There, there's a we'll pull up this article quickly here. Uh, the truth behind 40 acres and a mule. The truth behind 40 acres and a mule by uh, Dr. Henry Lewis Gates Jr. And as I said before, you know, I disagree with him on some things. Then with transatlantic slave trade, but I, I've said he does some good research. I've read dozens of his articles. I've read two of his books. Um, so read this article here for more information. The truth behind 40 acres and a mule. Also, this article is at PBS.org, public broadcasting system as well. Because many people totally misunderstand uh, special field on the, special field order number 15, 40 acres and a mule. A lot of people totally misunderstand that. Okay. All right, so read that. Uh, Shakita, let, I, I want to go to clip one. We're going to, I'm going to squeeze this in uh, before we run out of time here. We'll come back to this topic in just a minute. But I, I want to uh, squeeze this in dealing with uh, Andrew Brown. Okay. So uh, the family of Andrew Brown was able to uh, view, uh, I think it was less than 20 minutes of footage uh, of the killing of Andrew Brown today. They were not able to make copies. The video is not uh, being shown to the public. But um, what they saw, they say, further confirms their notion that he was executed, he was unjustly Killed. Uh, let's go to this clip, uh, Shakita. Brown's family and attorney say they got a clearer idea of what happened when the 42 year old was shot and killed by deputies almost three weeks ago in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. What we saw on that video was an unjustified killing. <laughs> Following days of protests, a judge ordered the sheriff to allow the family and their attorney to view 18 minutes and 40 seconds of the 118 minutes of video recorded by deputies that day. We were able to see Mr. Brown sitting in his vehicle as he was ambushed and as the sheriff's office made their way to his residence. Appearing to be surprised, it appears that he was possibly on the phone. At all times, his hands were visible. At all times, you can see that he was not a threat. He wasn't in the wrong at all. What's in the light? What's in the dark going to come to the light? Deputies were executing an arrest warrant. The 42-year-old was in his car. As deputies approached, authorities say Brown drove off and hit at least one officer. He did not see any actions on Mr. Brown's part where he made contact with them or tried to go in their direction. The SWAT team opened fire, according to a family-ordered autopsy, a final deadly shot hitting Brown in the back of his head. In court two weeks ago, a lawyer representing the deputies said they were justified. We believe that the shooting was justified. Lawyers for the Brown family say the district attorney, Andrew Womble, should recuse himself because he has worked with deputies for years without directly responding. The DA says he took an oath to abide by North Carolina law. Okay, that's from uh, NBC Nightly News. Uh, there's an article from uh, CNN also dealing with this, uh, dealing with this case all, uh, as well. Uh, police body camera video shows Andrew Brown Jr. shooting was unjustified, uh, attorneys say. Okay, we'll talk some more about this story uh, probably on tomorrow's show. All right. Uh, well, to, uh, Chance Lynch, who's one of the Brown family attorneys, said he and the family were able to watch six videos. The first video was a, da a dash camera a video with no sound, and the last five were all body camera footage. Uh, Attorney Chance Lynch said, we were able to see some critical footage that yields some truth and transparency to what we thought we would see from the beginning. 
uh, so they're basically saying what they saw further confirms that he was unjustly killed. So read this article also from CNN.com. Okay, those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Keep watching. Uh, we're going to go for a few more minutes, and we'll talk about Tim Tebow and Colin Kaepernick. Uh, you can support The African History Network, dollar sign, The AHN Show, through Cash App and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash The AHN Show. Be sure to register for my online course on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Remember, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right, stand by. Stand by. Okay. Now, when you have these... Uh, Native American nations owning slaves. This is also how you get a Sarah Rector uh, in Oklahoma. And we've talked about Sarah Rector before. Uh, there's, a, there's a good article from facetofaceafrica.com about Sarah Rector, who became known as the, uh, the richest Afro-American girl in the world. And her family uh, was from... Um, enslaved Creek ancestry because her family uh, had been owned by uh, Creek Indians in Oklahoma. Sarah Rector is like a really, really important piece of history that ties all this history together. Uh, we've talked about this before. This is from face-to-faceafrica.com. Um, meet Sarah Rector, the 12-year-old became who became America's youngest black millionaire in 1913 and in this article it talks about the uh black uh, the black freedman indian treaties of 1866 you may hear dr claude anderson talk about this uh, as well um sarah uh, see uh sarah rector was born in indian territory on march 3rd 1902 according to sources she was considered colored though not african-american her parents were owned by creek indians before the civil war as as the site the u.s uh slave explains she and some 600 other uh black children were entitled to land allotments as the children of enslaved people belonging to the creek nation okay why is this in 1866 the creek nation uh signed a treaty signed a treaty with the United States uh, in 1866, the Creek Nation signed a treaty with the United States government promising to emancipate their 16,000 slaves and incorporate them into their nation as citizens entitled to, quote, equal interest, equal interest in the soil and national funds. Uh, two decades later, the federal, the federally imposed Dawes Allotment Act that we just talked about, the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, sparked the beginning of the total assimilation of the Indians of the so-called five civilized tribes by forcing them to live on individually owned lots of land instead of communally, as they had done for centuries. Okay, that ties into the the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. Okay, so read the, uh, read the rest of this article. Meet Sarah Rector, the 12 year old uh, who became America's youngest black millionaire in 1913, all right? So this is why it's important to understand a chronology of history, cause and effect, okay? Historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events, okay? They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead to a larger uh, event taking place. If you read the book by Hannibal B. Johnson, I've done um, an extensive lecture dealing with the history of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. If you if you read this book here by Hannibal B. Johnson, uh, Black Wall Street from Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District, uh, this book when I was uh, preparing for 
uh, a lecture I was doing dealing with the history of Black Wall Street. I read this book and he deals with the Black Freedmen Indian treaties in here. That ties into the history of Tulsa, Oklahoma. That ties into the history of the Greenwood District and Black Wall Street. All, all of this history is connected. Okay, all this history is connected. Okay, who we have here? Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. How's everybody doing? Okay. All right. All right, so let's continue here. And um, let me refresh the screen. I want to make sure we have a good connection. Stand All right, so we're gonna continue, I wanna continue this discussion. There's a little more information dealing with the Trail of Tears that uh, I wanna get to. There was an article from, from Smithsonian Institute we'll look at briefly. Then there's also some good information from uh, history.com dealing with the Trail of Tears, okay? We'll look at that uh, here in just a minute. Uh, you're watching the African History Network show. If you want to advertise with the African History Network, uh, email us at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, okay? Or you can email us at theahnshow at gmail.com. All right, we'll be back in a few minutes. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that'll satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted, empower yourself. Start your free trial today. getting ready for fall or winter we have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for comedic african fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist we're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our african heritage Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle Her Hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustle Her Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. 
Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. Welcome back to the African History Network show. Okay. Um, all right, let's continue here. I'm briefly dealing with the uh, Trail of Tears. So we talked about Sarah Rector, we talked about the article from um, uh, CNN also. Uh, very quickly here, I want to now, there's a good piece from history.com uh, dealing with the Trail of Tears. And uh, this one here is from history.com dealing with the Trail of Tears. And it, it lays out uh, some history and lays out what happened. And once again, the uh, May 28th, May 28th uh, is the anniversary of the signing of the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which was signed uh, May 28th, 1830, okay? It was signed May 28th, 1830. So if we look at this article, it talks about how at the beginning of the 1830s, Nearly 125,000 Native Americans lived on millions of acres of land in Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Alabama, North Carolina, and Florida. Land their ancestors had occupied and cultivated for generations. By the end of the decade, very few uh, Natives remi remained anywhere in uh, the southeastern United States. Working on behalf of white settlers, who to grow cotton on the Indian's land, the federal government forced them to leave their homelands and walked hundreds of miles to a specifically designated Indian territory across the Mississippi River. So they were pushed out west of the M Mississippi River. This difficult and sometimes deadly journey is known as the Trail of Tears. So it talks about the Indian problem. What is America to do with these Native Americans that uh, many white people in America thought were savage? Okay, thought they thought they were savage and and killers and heathens and pagans and all types of things like this. Now, white Americans, particularly those who lived on the Western frontier, uh, feared and resented the Native Americans they encountered, but yet they stole their land anyway. Uh, to them, American Indians seemed to be an unfamiliar alien people well that's how we thought of white people too but anyway uh who occupied land that white settlers wanted and believed they deserved now some officials in the early years of the american republic such as uh president uh, george washington uh believed that the best way to solve this indian problem was simply to civilize the Native Americans. But in civilizing the Native Americans, that meant to teach them to be white. Now, the goal of this civilization campaign, the goal of this civilization campaign was to make Native Americans as much like white Americans as possible by encouraging them to convert to Christianity, learn to speak and read English, and adopt European style economic practices, European style economic practices, uh, such as individual ownership of land and other property, including in some instances in the South, owning African slaves. Now, the process, see, th see, this is why history is so important, because it tells you how you got to this point that you're in. The same process that they use to teach Native Americans, the, the five civilized tribes of Native Americans, teach them how to be white. There's a similar process they used on us, on African Americans. There's a similar process. Not only that, they're going to set up Native American schools for Native American children. And these were boarding schools. And these schools were designed to teach Native American children how to be white. 
the most famous school is called the Carlisle School. And at these at these schools, uh, these boarding schools, they were forbidden to speak their Native American languages. Okay, I'm gonna see if we got there's an article on this that I read. Uh, I think it's from history.com. Government boarding schools. Government boarding schools. Okay. They they were forbidden to speak their Native American language. They were forbidden to wear their traditional clothing. They had the they, they were given white names or, or English names, uh, white English names, Christian names, things like this. They had to cut their hair. They couldn't wear like you know the traditional Native American hairstyles. Uh, this article right here breaks this, breaks down this history. Government boarding schools. Government boarding schools once separated Native American children from families. Government boarding schools once separated Native American children from families. Once they returned home, Native American children struggled to relate to their families after being taught that it was wrong to speak their language or practice their religion. So what Europeans were doing was causing a divide between the elders and the and the and the parents causing the divide between them the previous generation and the children and you're infecting the children teaching them how to be white this is this is what's taking place okay so if you look at that tactic that was used to attack native american children then you look at negative corporate controlled hip hop which is used to brainwash and, 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 and to uh, infect the brain and psyche of African-American children and brainwash them. And this uses, it's used as a tool of destruction as well. You see a similar process. You, you see a similar process. This is why you have to understand history. See, a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. It also teaches you how to defend yourself against these attacks because this stuff repeats itself. It may not repeat itself exactly, but it rhymes. It may not repeat itself exactly, but it rhymes. So if you can, if you understand history, you can change the trajectory of the future, but you have to understand how to perceive these attacks coming towards you. If you understand history, you can see these attacks coming. This is why in 2016, months before the presidential election, I was warning our people about Donald Trump. I saw the attacks that were coming because I understood Richard Nixon and I understood George Wallace. And everything I said turned out to be true. Okay, so read this article here. Uh, in 1879, okay, the, Car the Carlisle School is the most famous Native American school, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. How many people have never heard of this information before? The Carlisle Indian Industrial School was a government-backed institution that forcibly separated Native American children from their parents in order to kill the Indian in him and save the man. In 1879, U.S. Cavalry Captain Richard Henry Pratt opened a boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, but it was not the kind of boarding school in which, it was not the kind of boarding school, it was not the kind of boarding school that rich parents send their children to. Rather, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School was a government-backed institution that forcibly separated Native American children from their parents in order to, as uh, Richard Henry Pratt put it, kill the Indian in him and save the man. Over the next several decades, Carlisle served as a model for nearly 150 such schools that were set up to teach Native American children how to be white. There was approximately 150 schools like this in America. They opened around the country. 
like the 1887, there it is again, the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, foreign resources, and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. This is why you have to understand history, history and policies and laws are intersected. They intersect. They, they, they're combined. Okay? Like the 1887 Dawes Allotment Act that reallocated Native American land or the Bureau of Indian Affairs 1902 haircut order specifying 1902 haircut order specifying that men with long hair could not receive rations. Native American boarding schools were a method of forced assimilation. The end goal of these measures was to make Native people more like white Anglo-Americans who had taken over their land. Well, they used some of these same tactics on African-Americans. This is why many of us still have our slave master's name or former slave master's name. At boarding schools, staff forced indigenous uh, students to cut their hair and use Anglo-American names because they're teaching them to see reality through the eyes of Europeans. So they're forcing European culture on them and stripping them of Native American culture, turning them against their parents and their grandparents and their ancestors. They forbid, they forbid the children from speaking their native language and observing their religious and cultural practices. Does that sound familiar? And by removing them from their homes, the schools disrupted students' relationships with their families. And by removing them from their homes, the, the, the school disrupted students' relationships with their families and other members of the Native American tribe. Once they return home, children struggled to relate to their families after being taught that it was wrong to speak their language or practice their religion. So this shows uh, children of an Apache tribe before and during their time at the Carlisle Industrial School. They were taught to be white. Many of us have been taught to be white. But we we don't understand it. See, your, your history and culture acts as a as an immune system that protects you from attackers coming in and attacking you. It acts as an immune system. When you strip away that immune system, you become sick, you become infected. So read the rest, read this full article here. I don't have time to get into it. Only have so much energy and so much time. Read the rest of this article. Um, we'll continue now. I want to go back to, because all this history is tied together. We have to understand the tactics that would have been used in the past to attack us so we understand how to defend ourselves against these tactics. Because they're taking place today. But if you don't understand the history behind what it is that you're seeing, you may think it's something beneficial. And when they talked about the economic system, see, we come from uh, we, we, we came from a, a system of cooperative economics, the co-ops, the cooperatives. Right. Where um, like the Colored Farmers Union, of 1886. And you read um, you read Dr. Jessica, Jessica Gordon Nimhard book, uh, read her book. Collective Courage, which deals with the history of cooperative economics among African Americans. Well, many of us went to white business schools and learned white business principles and learned capitalism, individual capitalism. And then we brought white business principles back to the African American community, where historically we had a history like the, the Colored Merchants Association, uh, founded in about 1928, coming out of the Negro Business League, which was created by Booker T. Washington. You had all these cooperatives where we collectively uh, own, we, we, uh, where um, we were members in these organizations, collectively own these organizations, many times collectively own businesses, but we pulled resources together. This is how we, this is how we made it. But then when we, when we went to white business schools and learned white business principles 
and learned about individual capitalism and then brought these white business principles back to the African-American community and implement them. They may, they may work for your family, but they don't work in general for the collective. And then when you break up the cooperatives, you help to break up the cooperation. When you break up the cooperatives, you help to break up the cooperation because for the cooperatives to work, you have to cooperate. All right. So let me see something here. Uh, okay. So let's go back to uh, this one here, dealing with the the the, the trail of in, uh, trail of tears from history.com trail of tears now this is some of the type of information also that we deal with in the online course that i teach ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade with the teaching school but we deal with thousands of years of history and this is a nine week 18 hour it's a nine week online course that i teach saturdays 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time we'll post the link again so you can register for the class uh so next class is saturday may 15th okay so the goal of this civilization campaign to civilize Native Americans was to make Native Americans as much like white Americans as possible by encouraging them to convert to Christianity, learn to speak English, learn to speak and read English, and adopt European, adopt European style economic practices, such as the individual ownership of land and other property other property included owning slaves in, in in the south now in the in the southeastern united states many choctaw chickasaw seminole creek and cherokee people embraced these customs these white customs and became known as the five civilized tribes of native americans the five civilized tribes of native americans okay but their land located in parts of Georgia, Alabama, California, Florida, and Tennessee was valuable, and it grew to be more coveted as white settlers flooded the region. Many of these, uh, of these white people yearned to make their fortunes by growing cotton, by growing cotton, and they did not uh, care how civilized their native neighbors were. They wanted that land and they would do almost anything to get it, including killing them for it. They stole lives. They burned and looted houses and towns, committed mass murder among Native Americans, and squatted on land that did not belong to them. This is white people doing this. This, this. this is Europeans here in this country doing this to Native Americans. And some Native Americans were African people also, because we, uh, we intermixed into these populations in see going back to the first americans with africans documented evidence by dr david m hotel and i'll probably have them uh teach another session of the class i'll probably have them speak to my class as well uh this time around when you read uh, just so you know when you register for the online course you get to um you will have access to the class i taught in february and march and he was one of the guest speakers in the class when I taught in February and March. So you'll be able to watch that. It's exclusive content. Okay. You'll be able to watch that. Also, Sister Nubia Wartford, who's a cultural anthropologist, she spoke to my class as well. You'll be able to watch that also. Uh, we dealt with the uh, African queens of antiquity in ancient Africa. So um, when, when you deal with African people who were here when native when uh, Europeans came to this land, European settlers came here. Some of these African, some of these groups of African people get reclassified as Native Americans. Also, that's the other thing. Okay, that's the that's the other part of history that gets left out. This is why 1619, even though 1619 is an important year, I mean, it's like we were here for thousands of years before 1619. This is one of the problems with the 1619 project. It does not deal with the history of African people in this land going back thousands of years. Okay, now this is the book I was looking for. 
by Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhard, Collective Courage, Collective Courage, a history of African-American cooperative economic thought and practice. This deals with our deep, rich history of the co-ops and how we economically empowered ourselves. Everything from the Free African Society to the Colored uh, Merchants Association. We have a deep, rich history of, of economic development through the co-ops, the cooperatives. All right, let's see here. Okay, so then they talk about Andrew Jackson, all this. Read the rest of this, okay. I don't have time to get through all this. You have the, the Donald Trump's favorite president, white supreme Andrew Jackson. Read this article from history.com, Trail of Tears, Trail of Tears, okay. And let me see, any removal, Andrew, okay. Uh, let, me, let me get to the highlights, because I have some notations here that I'm, uh, Indian problem. Which okay, Indian problem stole livestock with southern states were determined to take ownership of Indian lands who would go to okay. Indian removal. Um Indian removal, Indian removal, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson had long been an advocate for Indian removal as an army general. Uh he had spent years leading brutal campaigns against the Creeks, the Creek Indians in Georgia and Alabama and the Seminoles in Florida. We know a lot of Seminoles. Were, were Africans and rental slaves, things like this. Um, the Seminoles in Florida, uh, campaigns that resulted in the transfer of, of hundreds of thousands of acres of land from Indian nations to white farmers. So, so, so Florida was Spanish territory up until about 1821. And one of the reasons why the U.S. wanted that land in Florida is because a lot of uh, African slaves were running away, running into Florida, living with Native Americans. OK, because Florida was free territory, it was Spanish territory in it's free territory up until about 1821, when when uh, right around 1821, the U.S. takes over that territory. OK. All right. This see, this is a deep history. This is why you have to understand a chronology of history. Now, as as president, Andrew Jackson continued this crusade against Native Americans. In 1830, he signed the Indian Removal Act. It was May 28th, 1830. He signed the Indian Removal Act, which gave the federal government the power to exchange native held land in the Cotton Kingdom east of the Mississippi uh, River for land to the west of the Mississippi River in the Indian Colonization Zone, the Indian Colonization Zone that the United States had acquired as part of what? The Louisiana Purchase of 1803. The Louisiana Purchase of 1803. And that in Louisiana Purchase came about because the Haitians beat the hell out the French. Okay? During the Haitian Revolution. This Indian territory was located in present day Oklahoma. This is why you have to understand the chron chronology of history. It's, it's one of my teachers, Akaba Hiawatha Kamene, says historical events. Uh, he says to, um, to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. To understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. Now, the law required the government to negotiate removal treaties fairly, voluntarily, and peacefully, but we know they don't do that. It did not permit the president or anyone else to coerce native native uh nations into giving up their land however white supremacist president andrew jackson and his government frequently ignored the letter of the law and forced native americans to vacate lands they had lived on for generations in the winter of 1831 under threat of invasion by the u.s army the choctaw uh became the first nation to be expelled from its land altogether they made the journey to Indian territory on foot, some bound in chains and marched double file, one historian writes, and without food, supplies, or help from the, from the U.S. government. Thousands of people died along the way. It was one Choctaw leader, it was, uh, one Choctaw leader told an Alabama newspaper, it was a trail of tears and death. A trail of tears and death. The Indian removal process continued. In 1836, the federal government drove Creek Indians from their land for the last time. 3,500 of the 15,000 Creeks who set out for Oklahoma did not survive the trip. And it's going to be around eight, right around 1836. 
when the creek go into Oklahoma, they're going to found an area they call Talasi. Talasi. Talasi became Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa is from a Creek Indian word, Talasi. Read the rest of this. Okay, I don't want, I don't want time to get through all this. Trail of Tears from History.com. History.com is the official website of the History Channel. Okay. Now, lastly, there was an article, and then we'll get to Tim Tebow in just a second. We'll talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, there was a, a, a piece from a big article from SmithsonianMag.com that I, uh, I was looking at and I referenced a couple of days ago. Now, this also is it, this also ties into Lewis Cass. Now, Lewis Cass is the white man who Cass Technical High School is named after. Famous Cass Technical High School here in Detroit, my alma mater. And Lewis Cass was a slave owner. Now, from reports, he owned one slave. But I posted this article a couple of days ago. And there was a building renamed um, a, a, a state building renamed. It was it was named after Lewis Cass, and it was renamed. Let me see if I can pull this up. But it deals with the history of Lewis Cass. Lewis Cass was the Secretary of State under President Andrew Jackson's administration, and Lewis Cass helped to carry out the Indian Removal Act that not only pushed Native Americans off their land, but pushed African people off their land also, because uh, some of the people who were on the uh, Trail of Tears were African people because they were owned by uh, these Native American nations, okay? So let's see here. Uh, what's the name of that article? Retracing Slavery's Trail of Tears, Retracing Slavery's Trail of Tears. This is a big article from the uh, SmithsonianMag.com from the Smithsonian Institute. Retracing Slavery's Trail of Tears, okay? America's Forgotten Migration. Now, it, I, I want people to understand. People who understand their history and respect themselves don't name their institutions after their oppressors. They don't name their institutions after the oppressors that help carry out genocide against their own people. They don't, they don't name their institutions after people who help kill their ancestors. They name their institutions after people who help to liberate them, not keep them oppressed. This is why Cass Technical High School, the name needs to be changed. Why the hell would you have a, a, a school named after a white supremacist like Lewis Cass? That makes no sense. But some of us gain uh, prestige and um, gain um, self-esteem from closer proximity to white supremacy. Retracing slavery's trail of tears. Retracing slavery's trail of tears. This is from SmithsonianMag.com, um, Smithsonian Institute, their, their, their um, website, their magazine. America's forgotten migration, the journey of a million African Americans from the tobacco south to the cotton south. Okay, and it talks about um, the forced migration of African Americans, African people, African slaves. As well, this one here. Uh, I don't have time to get deep into this. We may do a separate. Uh, we may do something separate on this. But check out check out this article. This is um, I think maybe about 15, 20 pages, something like that. This article. Um, let me go to very quickly here. Let me go to page five. Just a second. 
Okay. Slave Trail of Tears. The Slave Trail of Tears is the great. What is that? The Slave Trail of Tears is the great missing migration, a thousand mile long river of people, all of them black or African, reaching from Virginia. During the 50 years before the Civil War, Civil War starts in 1861, about one million enslaved people moved from Upper South, Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, to Deep South, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. They were made to go, deported, you could say having been sold. This forced resettlement was 20 times larger than Andrew Jackson's Indian removal campaigns of the 1830s, even though there were Africans then also on the Trail of Tears, that, that one in the 1830s, about a third of those people with the Native Americans, about a third of them somewhere around that were African slaves. And now I've heard some people say some of them were servants or whatever. Okay. All right. That makes you feel better and sleep better at night. This forced resettlement was 20 times larger than Andrew Jackson's Indian removal campaigns of the 1830s, which gave rise to the original Trail of Tears as it drove tribes of Native Americans out of Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. It was bigger than the immigration of Jews into the United States during the 19th century when some 500,000 arrived from Russia and Eastern Europe. Okay. Um, it was bigger than the wagon train migration to the West, beloved of American lore. This movement lasted longer and grabbed up more people than any other migration in North America before 1900. Okay, this is about a, a million because you know the great migration of 1915 to 1970, you have between six to seven million African Americans migrating out of the South, up North and out West. The drama of a million individuals going so far from their homes changed the country, changed the United States. It gave the Deep South, a character it retains to this day, and it changed the slaves themselves, traumatizing uncountable families. But until recently, the slave trail was buried in memory. The story of the masses who trekked a thousand miles from the, from the tobacco South to the cotton South sometimes vanished in an economic tale. One about the invention of the cotton gin, which is around 1793, and the rise of King Cotton. It sometimes sank into a political story, something to do with the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 and the first Southwest, the young states of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. Historians know about the slave trail. During the last 10 years, a number of them, Edward Baptist, he's, he's a Facebook friend of mine, Edward Baptist, historian Edward Baptist, uh, Stephen Dale, Robert, uh, Guts, uh, Mestad, uh, Walter Johnson, Joshua Rothman, Calvin uh, Shemmerhorn, Michael Tadman, and others have been writing the million person migration back into view. Okay, so read it to this. This is, a, this is a long article here. Uh, this is from Smithsonian Mag. Retracing Slavery's Trail of Tears. Retracing Slavery's Trail of Tears. This happens after the uh, um, yeah. This happens after the Trail of Tears in the 1830s, and this is a Trail of Tears of one million. This is a journey of one million uh, African Americans from the Tobacco South uh, to the Cotton South. All right. Okay, so check that out. We'll post this link here. All right now, if you, uh, let's see. Be sure to register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. 
understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history. And uh, we do what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have articles, like some of the articles are shared here. I got, it's about 50 articles that I do within a class, something like that. So it's like really deep uh, articles, uh, video clips, book references, everything. Okay. We, uh, we do the classes live on Saturdays, uh, Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then all the sessions are recorded also, so you can uh, watch it over and over again. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay. So check that out. Now, uh, lastly, I want to deal with this last topic here. And let me see how much time we have. Because I really feel like doing this tomorrow. Uh, this deals with Colin Kaepernick and white privilege and Tim Tebow and white privilege, okay? Uh, let me set this up, okay. We'll squeeze this in here, talk about this for a couple of minutes. Watching the African History Network show and uh we'll be back in a few minutes stand by Black Bees products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Digital Dandelion's technical solutions works with businesses like yours to create an operations manual for your business, which is something many businesses don't have. According to AARP, more than 30% of small business owners are over 50 years old. Many business owners want to retire by selling their businesses or by passing their businesses on to their children. However, according to Forbes Investment Advisors, many retiring owners attempts to sell their businesses for retirement fail. You cannot sell your business without a business manual. Your children also cannot inherit your business because there is no way to run it. Your business does not have to die when you leave. Their business Bible products will give you the tools you need for a thriving business that can make you money even after you retire. Are you looking at increasing your business's annual revenue? Digital Dandelions can help you make at least $100,000 in annual revenue and expand your business. Speak with them today about solidifying your business. Visit digitaldandelions.com today and get a free 30-minute consultation. All right. Welcome back to the African History Network show. Okay. Uh, now, for American business owners, email us at African History, uh, AHN show at African History Network.com, AHN show at African History Network.com, or um, Email us at theahnshow at gmail.com to find out how to advertise with us. So uh, I saw this story here from uh, newsone.com, and I think also the Rio had a story about this as well. And this is dealing with uh, Tim Tebow, uh, former uh, NFL quarterback, Tim Tebow. Uh, let me see. Hold on just a second here. Let me refresh the screen just a second. Stand by. All 
All right. So I, I saw this story uh, from news1.com and this deals with uh, Tim Tebow. And it appears Tim Tebow is going to be back in the NFL. And a lot of people are calling this white privilege because uh, Colin Kaepernick is uh, still uh, being banned. He's still left out. Okay. Let's see here. White privilege, NFL style, Tim Tebow's return to football before Colin Kaepernick sparks outrage. Critics once said Kaepernick's kneeling was a disrespectful distraction. Tim Tebow has been celebrated for it. Okay, critics said, critics once said Colin Kaepernick's kneeling was a disrespectful distraction. Tim Tebow has been celebrated for, for kneeling. Now, I mean, this is a picture of Tim Tebow kneeling, Colin Kaepernick. So the expected signing of a uh, of white former NFL player, uh, Tim Tebow, who has not played pro football, has not played pro football um, in nearly a decade, and was widely regarded as a failure during his time in the league has renewed outrage over the apparent refusal to give Colin Kaepernick a second chance on the gridiron. Okay. Um, an apparent ref refusal to give Colin Kaepernick a second chance on the gridiron. Now Kaepernick hasn't played since about 2016. Okay. But um, he was he was better. He was a better quarterback on his worst day than Tim Tebow ever was. Now, okay, let's continue here just a second. All right, let's continue. So Tim Tebow, who has not com competed in the NFL regular season, in the NFL regular season game since the 2012 season, four years longer than when Colin Kaepernick last played, Tim Tebow has reportedly, uh, was reportedly going to sign a one-year contract with his hometown Jacksonville Jaguars to play tight end. I was just tight end, that's right, tight end, not quarterback. I was thinking of, yeah, tight end. Uh, a position he has never played before. I thought, I thought, I think he was, a, I think Tim Tebow was a quarterback. Uh, just say, I thought Tim Tebow was a quarterback. Yeah, he was a quarterback. He's playing tight end, a position he's never played before. That's right. I remember him playing quarterback. It wasn't a good one, but yeah, he, he had more hype off the field. Thinking back to when he played, he had more hype off the field than he did on the field for his, you know, how well he played. So Tim Tebow, who was a quarterback and has never played tight end before, he's being signed to a one-year contract with his hometown Jacksonville Jaguars to play tight end, a position he has never played before on any level of competition. Now, uh, that report stood in stark contrast to the deafening silence surrounding Colin Kaepernick and his return to the league, which is likely to never happen for political and non-athletic reasons. Um, now, uh, Ian Rappaport uh, posted on Twitter from NFL Now, Tim Tebow is expected to sign with the Jaguars. He's back with a chance to make uh, the team and help uh, their locker room. Very interesting. Let me flip over here. This is uh, in the article from news1.com. Okay. And then May 10th, 2020. 
Uh, now, the, that report stood in stark contrast to the deafening silence surrounding Colin Kaepernick and his, and his return to uh, the league which is likely to never happen for political and non-athletic reasons. Waiting for Colin Kaepernick to sign with the Jaguars as a tight end to wait, no, uh, Josina Anderson posted on Instagram. Uh, now, one critic referred to the scenario as white privilege NFL style, white privilege NFL style. Stephen Pasquale said Tim Tebow finding a team and Colin Kaepernick can't. White privilege NFL style. Tebow can't throw, never could, never played tight end, and hasn't played in, what, eight years? Explain it to me like I'm five, like I'm five years old. Now, Bossip, uh, the um, the, uh, web, the website Bossip brought attention to NFL veteran Des Bryant's reaction uh as disbelief upon learning that Tim Tebow could sign a new contract. Des Bryant, who is currently a free agent, said, quote, understands how hard it is to get on a team and stay on a team, end quote, even with talent, Bossa wrote. Des Bryant tweeted, so Tebow, having, having played an NFL game in damn near a year, Damn near a decade, I should say. Damn near a decade. It's that simple. No hate, but you got to be kidding me. Now, the Heisman uh, Trophy winning quarterback, whose success in college translated to him playing in a total of 35 regular season games and one playoff game over the course of three seasons, Tim Tebow is an icon in pop culture, notably because of his expressed Christian faith. There's no scenario in which Tim Tebow provides more use on the football field than Colin Kaepernick. Absolutely zero, said, Graf, said Grant uh, Liffman on, uh, on Twitter. Okay, so check out the rest of these comments. Uh, Ahmed Ali on Twitter said, interesting how the same people that are praising Tim Tebow for his values outside football see Colin Kaepernick's values as a distraction, taking a knee. They both took knees. Ahmed Ali said, interesting how the same people that are praising Tim Tebow for his values outside of football see Colin Kaepernick's values as a distraction. Now, never mind that Kaepernick once led his team to the Super Bowl while Tim Tebow has played in just one playoff game. Joe uh, Prano on uh, Twitter said, remember, Colin Kaepernick isn't in the NFL because uh, he was a terrible quarterback. He brings the media circus everywhere. He hasn't played in years. Kneeling is disrespectful. Okay, and they show uh, Tim Tebow uh, kneeling. Now, the most notable contrast between, between Tim Tebow and Colin Kaepernick, their demonstrative, demonstrative kneeling, Tim Tebow was celebrated for his kneeling, while uh, which became a cultural trend known as T-bowing as people mimic the quarterback's moment of prayer. See, he was celebrated because of his Christian faith and kneeling and praying. And Colin Kaepernick was vilified for taking the knee, which came from the military because it was uh, former Green Bay Packer uh, uh, Nate Boyer. I think he played for the Green Bay Packers. Nate Boyer who met with uh, uh, Colin Kaepernick and he's the one who gave Kaepernick the idea to take a knee because at first Kaepernick was sitting on the bench. He is the one who gave Colin Kaepernick the idea to take a knee because taking a knee comes from the military and it's a sign of respect. There's an article here from uh, Seahawkshire.usa today about Nate Boyer. I think he played. I think he played for the 
Green Bay Packers, I think. Nate Boyer, not unpatriotic to kneel before the American flag. Okay. Um, Seattle Seahawks, play for the Seattle Seahawks. He was a Green Beret and played for the Seattle Seahawks. Former uh, Seattle Seahawks long snapper and United States Army Green Beret, Nate Boyer, expressed his thoughts about the American flag and its reaction to NFL player protest Sunday on Twitter. Now, this is an old article. This is from, uh, well, June 15, 2020. Yeah, yeah, June 15, 2020, this article. But Nate Boyer was the one who gave Colin Kaepernick the idea to take a knee. In 2016, when Colin Kaepernick initially sat down during the playing of the national anthem, the white national anthem, before games, Nate Boyer advised him to kneel instead of sit to show respect to the United States military while simultaneously protesting police brutality and racial inequality. Okay, so read the rest of this article here. All right, so you have uh, some people saying with T Tim Tebow coming back into the NFL, and he's been out, what, nine years, something like that. And he's been out four years longer than Kaepernick. They're saying this is white privilege. Sounds like it to me also. All right, so check out the rest of this article here from news1.com. White privilege NFL style. Tim Tebow's return to uh, NFL before Colin Kaepernick sparks outrage. Tim Tebow's return to NFL before Colin Kaepernick sparks outrage. All right, look, hey, that's going to do it for us. Uh, we have to get out of here. Remember the African History Network. Uh, well, you can support the African History network uh do cash app and paypal dollar sign the ahn show um do uh cash app and when you, when you do it through cash app be sure to type in dollar sign the ahn show uh s-h-o-w and it'll it'll show uh it'll say michael and show my picture there and then also through through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show and so, so let's keep broadcasting uh six days a week keep doing the research stay on the air and then register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Next class is Saturday, um, May 15th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. So if you miss anything, you have to work, what have you, you can go back and watch it. Okay, that's not a problem. You can go back and watch it. Um, and as soon as you register, you can watch the as soon as you registered, you can watch the class that we did uh, um, last Saturday. Okay. As soon as you register, let me post the link here again. So it's a nine week uh, online course that I teach. We do thousands of years of history. Even after the course is over with, you'll still have access to uh, view the course also. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, you focus on educating and empowering. Oh, and I have my Muhammad Ali shirt on, in case people were wondering. My Muhammad Ali shirt. All right, remember, the African History Network, you focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace.